We're continuing on my no rant version. This is the raw unedited video. <clears throat> so we're gonna look again, the two fuels we just covered, the burning of hydrogen and the burning of methane. If hydrogen is burned, we should get nothing but water out. If methane is burned, hopefully we'll get CO2. But if the oxygen levels fall, we'll move down this chain, producing CO and C. Carbon is visible to the eye. It will make the flame yellow and smoky. If the methane is burning clean, you will just get a blue flame and only the production of carbon dioxide. Hydrogen cannot produce a yellow flame because it contains no carbon in the first place. Both fuels will release water vapor. You'll see it in cold weather and you may feel it as humidity or see it as condensation if it's accumulating inside a building, such as running a propane heater in your garage. If we remove even further oxygen, it is possible to release unburned hydrogen, but we're not going to study that case. We'll keep enough oxygen to discuss the formation of carbon monoxide, not hydrogen gas. So obviously, that's a waste if fuel is still coming out the tailpipe of your machine. So given that equation and looking at it balanced, in the 1970s, some Russians decided when they hit a pocket of gas while drilling for an oil rig that they should set fire to the gas to burn it off so it was not a risk to the nearby town. But it turned out to be a lot of gas and it's still burning 50 years later. So this is coming from the earth. Is this methane or hydrogen? It's one of those two equations you just saw. Is it methane or hydrogen? Is the fire a balanced chemical reaction? Or is there insufficient fuel or insufficient oxygen? And if you can answer that, then you're, you get the meaning of those equations. Now let's look at propane and butane. Propane is very common, butane a little less, mostly occurring in cigarette lighters and some higher temperature stoves and uh, little jewelry soldering torches. Propane, we look at the carbons. Seems to be a fairly easy fix. Pop a three down there. Then we switch our attention to the hydrogens. Okay, pop a four. It's balanced. Now we take a look at the oxygens. Four here, six over here. So we need 10 in total. Gets trickier when we move on to butane. Four and one. That seems simple. Eh, 10 and two. I can balance that. I'll put a five there. And then the problem arises. Five oxygens plus eight oxygens on the right, four times two adds up to 13 oxygens. How do you get 13 out of the number two? You get it like that. But you can't have six and a half pairs of oxygen any more than you can have six and a half pair of blue jeans. Can you imagine if someone computed that? Oh, there's some people that are going camping and I worked out we need six and a half pair of blue jeans. So I'm gonna saw a piece a pair of them in two. No, in this case, the simplest thing to do to get everything to be whole numbers, double it all. Bingo, it's done. I would never ever ask you to balance butane. If you can do it, then you're heading into grade 12 chemistry. If you could figure that one out, pat yourself on the back, you're a year or two ahead cognitively of your peers, okay? So forget all about butane. This is that part of like training where I need you to be able to balance methane. I would like you to be able to do propane. So I'm going as far as butane, but seriously, forget it. So these are the four equations we've looked at that if you, if I wrote these on the board in September, you would have freaked. Now they look not so bad. Hydrogen, methane,
propane, then down to butane. Let's focus on these two to see why we need to balance our equations. The standard explanation is matter is neither created nor destroyed, so everything that went in must show up on the other end. But trust me, even if we fail to use enough oxygen and we don't write it, the carbon is still there. What's really important to me is if you switch from propane to methane and back, you're using wildly different amounts of oxygen. And if you don't understand that and don't readjust your machines, you, you can die from this. I'll give you an example. This is the natural gas in your house. This is the propane in your barbecue. It is possible to convert your barbecue, your hot water tank, and your furnace from propane to methane. You just change an adjuster on it and you can swap the gas. So let's suppose your, your barbecue is natural gas and you want to turn it to propane. Well, on natural gas, it was adjusted to provide two units of oxygen for one unit of fuel. If we're going to burn propane in it, we need to up the oxygen to level five. That's two and a half times greater. Now, on a Bunsen burner, that's easy. You just unscrew the chimney till the windows letting in the air are two and a half times bigger. But I guarantee you, the barbecue, your home furnace, and your hot water tank do not have adjustable air intakes. The only thing you can adjust is the fuel. So if you can't increase the air by two and a half times, then you need to cut down the fuel by two and a half times. And this is how they do it. These are changeable air orifices for furnaces and barbecues to change them from one fuel to another. So can you tell me which of these inlets allows you to use methane and which one lets you use propane? Well, if we can't change our air, then the propane machine must use two and a half times less propane to balance this equation. So that's the propane orifice. That's the methane. So I did a little math. I zoomed in and I measured on my computer screen. Now that's the size when I blew it up to an extreme size. And I'm going to compare the area of the two because that's going to determine the flow that comes through here. And I can pretend they're square. I don't have to use the round formula. So if I pretended that each of these is a square that far along, then this is the ratio of the areas of those two holes. And I came up with 2.25, just using the screen and counting pixels. That is almost bang on two and a half. It's so close that the difference is strictly the quality of the picture. So there it is when I took a photograph from the Weber website showing the two orifices to change their barbecues over from natural gas to propane, those two holes were one hole was two and a half times bigger than the other one. Exactly what this equation said. Okay, so this is the equation in the real world setting. Now let's take a look at another practical equation that you've worked with. You just don't know you have. Tin 2 oxide and hydrogen fluoride forms tin 2 fluoride and dihydrogen oxide. So how are we going to make an equation out of this? Write the valences first. That says it's plus 2. Oxygen you look up. Hydrogen you look up. You look it up. Tin 2 tells you it's plus 2. Dihydrogen tells you it's H2O for oxygen. I forgot to put the minus two there. I kind of buggered that one up. So it assembles like this. SnOHF turns to SnF2 plus H2O. This formula was stated. This one you have to think about. Plus two minus one. So it bonds like this. These two, it's one to one. One to one. Now let's balance it. Tins are okay. One on each side. Oxygens are okay. One on each side. The hydrogens, no. 
we have one here and we need two. 